Hello, this is Annette Weber from the University of Kentucky and today we will be talking about the ITE keywords related to hepatology. So here's a list of the keywords we will be covering today. Um, while in previous uh, lectures I've already covered those but uh, some of them are re-recorded and reviewed, the uh, keywords in yellow are newly added. So here's the organ we are going to talk about today, the liver. Um, as you can see in this graph, uh, pretty centrally located and also very much uh, centrally connected to major vascular structure. So here is a very, very short summary of the physiological facts you need to keep in mind uh, thinking about the liver. It weighs approximately 1.2 to 1.5 kilo. The hepatic blood flow is approximately 1.5 liter of blood per minute, which represents 20 to 25% of the total cardiac output. Now, the blood is uh, delivered to the liver in two different blood vessels. Okay. Um, one third of the blood flow comes from the hepatic artery, which is, in most cases, um, coming from the celiac artery, but sometimes there's an abnormality. Uh, it also can come off the SMA. But one third of the hepatic blood flow comes from the hepatic artery. The other two thirds come from the portal vein, which pretty much brings the uh, total uh, drainage, venous drainage of this GI system, everything except the rectum, therefore uh, gets cleared through the liver. So about two-thirds comes from the portal vein. However, if you look at the regional hepatic oxygen delivery, this is more 50-50 distribution, meaning 50% of the oxygen supply comes from the hepatic artery and 50% comes from the portal vein. The one-third, two-third uh, two uh, uh, blood supply ratio also is not a constant and we will review this in a um, following slide. The blood return away from the liver, uh, returning to the systemic circulation, comes through hepatic veins. Um, and the right and left hepatic vein join very closely uh, into the IVC, close to the diaphragm, so therefore right before it enters the uh, thorax. Thor um, uh, and so therefore it's very much um, subject to alterations in the interthoracic pressure. Due to the very close proximity to thorax and heart, um, the liver outflow tract is very susceptible to any changes in uh, right heart function or increased interthoracic pressure. Also that is the reason that whenever you are doing hepatic surgery and you worry about the um, hepatic outflow tract uh, CVP is actually a very good correlation um, of assessment of the hepatic venous pressure. In this little graph, I also uh, want you to remember the uh, histological um, configuration of the liver lobules. Um, so uh, hepatic artery, portal vein, and the uh, bile duct are very closely, uh, close proximity here in the corners while the central vein, which then ends up in the hepatic vein, is uh, located in the middle. And that is important to remember when it comes to the um, uh, liver function, the uh, 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 synthetic function of the liver. The hepatic blood flow regulation is a very well visited topic on the ITE. There are intrinsic controlling mechanisms and extrinsic controlling factors to keep in mind for the hepatic circulation. The intrinsic controlling factors, that is how the local vasculature regulates um, its regional tone and blood supply. The portal venous circulation and portal venous branches do not have any intrinsic regulation. The hepatic artery flow and hepatic artery branches do. The extrinsic controlling factors, this is a summary of the hepatic artery buffer response, metabolic regulation, and also neuronal factors. 
So the metabolic regulation uh, means that if there are any changes in the portal vein uh, blood pH, oxygen level, or CO2 level, meaning as the portal vein drains the GI system, if the blood pH drops, if the oxygen content in the portal vein drops, or the CO2 concentration increases, that will change the hepatic artery blood flow, meaning it increases. That's the so-called hepatic artery buffer response, and we will revisit this in the next slide. The neuronal regulating factors, yes, there are adrenergic receptors, alpha and beta receptors present at the um, hepatic uh, blood vessels. Uh, on the portal vein branches, there is some alpha response in those blood vessels, so there are alpha receptors. Uh, dopamine does not have any effect on the portal venous circulation. Glucagon also is a strong stimulant for the uh, hepatic blood vessels, and it causes some long-lasting arterial dilation. It antagonizes the vasoconstriction. Um, octreotide can inhibit the glucagon vasotoric effect, so therefore that's why octreotide is a treatment for portal hypertension. Also, there is a vasopressin response on the hepatic blood flow, meaning um, that vasopressin causes a splenchnic vasoconstriction, therefore decreases the portal vein blood flow, and therefore can increase the hepatic um, arterial blood flow. So now let's talk about the hepatic artery buffer response. As I stated earlier, um, the blood flow to the liver is usually one-third from the hepatic artery and two-thirds for the portal vein. However, this is not a constant ratio because due to GI function, GI nutritional content, the portal uh, vein blood flow um, varies quite a bit. Uh, the liver doesn't like variation, so therefore they want a constant hepatic blood flow. So therefore any variation in the portal vein blood flow is compensated by the hepatic artery. And what that means, if the portal vein blood flow is high due to the um, uh, nutrient concentration, etc., etc., the hepatic artery uh, blood flow can reduce. If the portal vein blood flow drops, then the hepatic artery blood flow will increase to uh, compensate for the decreased blood flow. The goal is that the total hepatic blood flow is maintained in a constant level, somewhat auto-regulated. There is a maximum to the response, so the hepatic artery can only compensate for 50% of the drops in the hepatic, uh, in the uh, portal vein blood flow. The mechanism primarily of this response is through adenosine, which is sec uh, secreted by the liver sinusoids, uh, which will cause uh, hepatic artery dilation, so therefore increasing the hepatic blood flow. So summarizing this, the hepatic artery compensates for the portal vein blood flow um, fluctuations. It's an adenosine-driven process, which means like whenever um, there is a decrease in portal vein blood flow, um, the sinusoids will, in, uh, will release or secrete the adenosine, so therefore increase uh, the hepatic artery blood flow. Very important to keep in mind that this is not a reciprocal process, which means that if there are any fluctuations in hepatic artery flow, the portal vein doesn't care, and so therefore will not change related to drops in hepatic artery flow. This is a very complex slide because I'm trying to summarize all the liver function in one slide for the sake of time, and as you know, as important the liver is as an organ, this is not easily achieved. You guys all can read, um, so there are multiple important functions the liver provides for the rest of the body, from metabolic, synthetic, drug elimination functions, immunological, regenerative, and homostatic factors. Uh, there are multiple. It is also important to remember that a lot of those areas are organized in the liver lobules 
um, according to oxygen availability and substrate availability. So the periportal zone, which is very close to portal vein and hepatic artery, this is where substrate and oxygen is rich. So glucogenesis, uh, 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 beta oxygenation, the urea cycle, all the P450 dependent functions need to be there because P450 is uh, very um, needy when it comes to oxygen availability. As closer as closer you go to the central vein, so therefore called the paracentral area, the oxygen availability drops. So substrate is still there, but not necessarily the oxygen. So the ketogenesis, uh, the biotransformation when it comes to the glucuronization and lipogenesis, um, that is located in zone three um, because uh, um, the oxygen level is still sufficient to accommodate those. In zone three, is, uh, I'm sorry, zone two is therefore like the um, yeah in between zone, um, and uh, the functions located there um, really depend on how much is consumed in one versus um, still present in um, zone three. The hepatic extraction ratio is a relatively new keyword used by the ABA in the last ITE. The hepatic extraction ratio rep, uh, describes the bioavailability of medications when they're given by mouth. So as greater as the hepatic extraction ratio is, as greater is the hepatic clearance, and so therefore less bioavailability also known as the first pass effect. So uh, hepatic extraction ratio of less than 0.3, that means that there's only a small portion of the drug uh, is cleared by the liver and therefore the drug has a high bioavailability. Uh, bio An example for this would be uh, acetaminophen. Yeah, acetaminophen has a high bioavailability, so therefore after giving uh, by mouth, almost means 100% of that medication is available for the systemic circulation because the liver um, does not metabolize it immediately. But if you have a high ext hepatic extraction ratio, closer to one, that means that the liver picks up a lot, there's a high first pass effect, low bioavailability. Um, if the hepatic extraction ratio is one, that means all of the drug is eliminated at first pass and not available in the systemic circulation. If a medication is given by mouth, the factors related to availability depend on how much is absorbed in the portal circulation, then how much is the hepatic extraction ratio, and then also hepatic blood flow contributes to it. Because as if you have a high uh, hepatic extraction ratio, anything above 0.7, that means increases in hepatic blood flow in, um, uh, due to the uh, increase in portal circulation, that also will mean that um, more drug is presented to the liver and therefore more drug is cleared and therefore more drug will be eliminated. So if you have a drug with a high hepatic extraction ratio, increases in hepatic blood flow also mean less drug availability in systemic circulation. I've given you some examples for medications so that high uh, hepatic extraction ratio, a lot of the opiates, hence they're not available you know, if you're giving by mouth, it has to be nasal or anything else which bypasses the liver. But methadone, for example, has a low hepatic extraction ratio. So therefore, that's why you can give methadone um, orally. Again, you can read through this. A lot of this makes a lot of sense. So how do we assess the liver function in the clinical environment? There are several parameters you send off when you ask for liver function tests. Um, the liver enzymes, AST and ALT, more represent the uh, hepatocellular damage. If there's any breakdown in hepatocytes, hepatocyte, uh, hepatocyte necrosis. There's a little bit of a difference in uh, pharmacokinetic. Um, the AST has a half-life of 17 hours versus ALT has a longer half-life, so obviously the EST um, shows you earlier disturbances. Solostatic markers, that would be the ALT and the gamma-GT, uh, they are very sensitive 
but not very specific for uh, changes and, and stress on the biliary system. Um, the gamma GT, um, you know, is commonly elevated when it's alcohol-related liver diseases. Markers of the synthetic liver function. This is albumin, coagulation factors, and the bilirubin because it truly represents what, what the liver uh, synthesizes. Albumin is only produced by the liver. It has a half-life of up to 20 days. So uh, changes in albumin level is not only related to a lack of production in, in the liver, but also is affected by nutrition, critical illness as a as an early fast and uh, 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 stress um, response, protein loss, and hormonal balances. I also want to mention here the difference between albumin and pre-albumin. Pre-albumin um, is a transport protein for thyroxine and retinol, uh, only produced by the liver, also called now transthyretine uh, or TTR. Uh, the liver produces TTR and secretes it in the blood, um, and it's also partially metabolized by the kidney. Serum pre-albumin concentrations of less than 10 milligrams per deciliter are associated with malnutrition. Uh, pre-albumin has been advocated as a nutritional marker, especially when it comes to refeeding on the elderly population, and it is... Um, a better marker, at least seen as a better marker than albumin because of its shorter half-life. Pre-albumin has a two to three day turnaround time, not like albumin um, up to 20 days. However, pre-albumin is not a precursor of albumin. It's a completely different transport protein. The only thing they have in common is it's a protein. Coagulation factors are solely produced by the liver, everything but factor eight but factor eight also is produced by the uh, liver sinusoid cells, so not hepatocytes, but the sinusoid cells. And bilirubin also reflects the sympathetic status of the liver because it represents the conjugation factor. Uh, when uh, the direct bilirubin becomes, uh, I'm sorry, when the indirect bilirubin becomes the direct bilirubin. It correlates with the hemoglobin degradation process. Uh, thrombocytopenia also can represent some form of liver disease as a form of portal hypertension as an indicator for increased resistance in the hepatic circulation uh, because your splenic blood flow therefore platelet uptake is increased when there is shunting towards the splenic, um, other splenic organ, especially the spleen. So how can we assess after surgery, and especially after liver surgery, if there is any form of liver dysfunction? We can monitor the synthetic function of the liver. So monitor your coagulation factors, so any type of INR elevation after surgery, after hepatectomy, uh, may be due to uh, liver dysfunction. However, you know, factor five and factor seven are the early markers in that cascade in our best factor production and uh, uh, it is related to that half-life of those two factors before this becomes evident. Bilirubin changes, uh, hyperbilirubinemia, um, can indicate liver dysfunction, especially if it's the direct bilirubin. Uh, but also here it takes a little bit of time before this becomes evident. The earliest marker probably is the lack of detoxification. So, um, metabolic acidosis and the lack of lactic clearance can be an indicator of hepatic dysfunction. So, what is the workup if postoperatively your patient has an elevation in bilirubin? Okay, hyperbilirubinemia. It can be pre-hepatic, it can be related to hepatic dysfunction, or it can be post-hepatic as an obstructive pattern. So that's how exactly how you work hyperbilirubinemia up. Okay. Anything before the liver is pre-conjugation process, so that is the indirect bilirubin elevation. All those factors shown in this slide, from overproduction 
impaired hepatic uptake or impaired conjugation creates an increased uh, indirect uh, bilirubin and uh, you know hemolysis is the big factor but obviously also Gilbert and Trigglanesia uh, syndrome um, is uh, something you need to work up for. So conjugated or direct bilirubin, now this is either due to liver function or the biliary obstruction. So any form of hepatitis, you know, metabolically, um, toxins, uh, drugs, cancer, sepsis, TPN, or Schollingitis, hepatocellular injury can uh, cause interhepatic dysfunction, therefore an increase in conjugated uh, bilirubin. So how do we grade the severity of liver disease or liver dysfunction in our patients? There are two different methods which you see used in the clinical environment, the child pew system um, and the MELT score. The child pew system is a little bit the older one, and as you see those factors here, it's the presence of encephalopathy, the presence of ascites, um, the bilirubin severity abnormality, and uh, um, albumin and coagulation abnormalities also here uh, more uh, the severity of. Um, the child pew um, assigns points and then that uh, from low mid child pew A to up to six points, uh, then category B is up to nine points and anything above uh, would be C and a maximum is 15 points. Uh, it does not really correlate well with the disease progression. However, it still identifies patients with advanced liver disease, which would be then a child to category C. The MELT score is a numerical score, looks at creatinine, bilirubin, and INR. Um, so therefore, it can come up with a true score. And it's easier to see if liver disease progresses from a low MELT, which would be below 10, then up to, you know, here we don't list for liver transplant until you have a, a MELT score of 14, unless you have exemption points. And when you have a MELT score of 40, that means really your um, life expectation for the next month um, you know, is, uh, can pretty well be predicted, okay, based on the MELT score. Since the MELT score is pretty commonly explored during the in training exam, let's just revisit this a little bit more in detail. So again, it's a numeric score. The fact that's contributing is bilirubin, INR, and creatinine as a reflection how closely the liver and the kidney are associated in their dysfunction. So any form of advanced liver disease will take a toll on the kidney, hence cause an elevation in creatinine. And that progression actually triggers um, the deterioration of the liver function. As I said earlier, the MELT score heavily used in uh, liver transplant decision making. Uh, we rarely use if your MELT is uh, lower than 14 because at that point the prediction based on MELT score in your mortality risk that allows us to correlate then uh, when is the pay operative. Uh, mortality risk lower than if we are proceeding without surgery. So if you have a MELT score in the 20s, that means like your uh, three months mortality risk also is around the 20s. Um, and if you have a MELT score above 40, the, you have a pretty good chance that you will not survive the next three months, meaning your mortality risk is above 70%. There are some exception points we are using for liver transplant listing with UNOS. So hyponatremia, because it's not captured in the MELT score, but it indicates progression in ascites and hepatobenal uh, syndrome. Um, and you also get exception points if you have hepatic pulmonary syndrome, because hepatic pulmonary syndrome uh, can be pretty significant with hypoxemia, but still stay at a lower MELT score. And also there are some exception points if you have hepatocellular carcinoma HCC. So what type of liver failures or liver dysfunctions do our patients present? Obviously, time frame is important. Acute liver failure, which is 
hyper acute, like onset within seven days. That means like jaundice, hypovolemia, air or and or hepatic encephalopathy, very fast timeline with severe symptom onset. Acute within a month or subacute um, within six months. It also can be acute and chronic as a just acute decompensation of chronic liver disease, either triggered by direct insult or just secondary to systemic progression or um, you know, an event related to your chronic liver disease, um, sepsis or GI bleed are commonly uh, seen. Or it can just be chronic liver failure and just your liver cirrhosis just progressed to an end stage picture. So what are the hallmarks of end stage liver disease, the pathophysiology we can all see in uh, those patients? Um, some of them are going through a little bit faster. Um, the ones in yellow, we are going to go through very detailed um, since this is a common IT target. Total hypertension, the increase in um, hepatic tissue, therefore the venous circulation will find shunts, other connections to the IVC, increases frantic circulation, uh, venal and uh, uh, spleen blood flow, commonly seen, esophageal varicosis, um, hemorrhoid bleeds, this all related to that portal hypertension. We'll talk about the cardiovascular response, fluid retention, hyponatremia, this is more, not, it's not a drop in sodium level, actually it's an increase in water level. Those patients are intervascularly depleted, but the total water body content is high, third spacing. Um, so their hyper, hyponatremia actually is delusional in nature. We'll talk about the renal dysfunction, we'll talk about the central nervous system and the pulmonary response. The coagulation abnormality, well, that's due to the sympathetic function, right? Um, so the lack of produ production of coagulation factors, but also keep in mind also all the anti-coagulation uh, factors also are decreased. So protein S, protein C are also not produced at normal level. So it's this weird picture of that you can be hypercoagulant but still making clots in the wrong areas. Uh, very thorough coagulation monitoring is needed in those patients just because of the complexity. Um, and your lack of uh, thrombocyte production due to the lack of bone marrow stimulation factors and the high uptake in the spleen that creates that thrombocytopenia. So also as a combination of portal hypertension but also lack of production. Your endocrinologic response, as important as the liver is as a gland and a steer captain of a lot of endocrinological func functions. Uh, the ADH, lack of stress response, needs to be mentioned here and the imbalance in your glucose hemostasis. Okay, earlier on, dysfunction made a hyperglycemia because of the uh, lack of storing glucose as glycogen form. But then more and more on is the lack of glycogen um, storage capacity at all. So they also don't have a buffer to release glucose when it is needed. Very complex picture and a complex impact on our body. The cardiovascular response to end stage liver disease, also very complex and important. On the vascular side, due to the inability to clear toxins, you know, you have a release of vasodilatory mediators by the protoendothelium, and that means it's endothelium and nitric oxide, so therefore you have a marked splanchnic arterial vasodilation in splanchnic underfilling. So despite the compensatory neurohumor response, renin, vasopressin, and norepinephrine, you see patients with a massive systemic vasodilation, low SEL. On the cardiac side, to compensate for that, those patients are usually hyperdynamic as a compensation for the massive vasodilation. As long as the heart can, you will see high cardiac uptake. But as more and more as your cirrhosis progresses and the lack of clearing those toxins, you also will get something what we call the, the cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which early on underdiagnosed because it's more a lack of reserve. But there also may be other factors like either alcohol or drug-induced cardiomyopathies. Overall, they can also have a different pathway of 
cardiomyopathy due to diabetes, amyloidosis, etc., etc. But cirrhotic cardiomyopathy commonly underdiagnosed. It's a lack of reserve function, so blunted inotropic and chronotropic function. Uh, it's a diastolic dysfunction, lack of filling, and then also can create a prolonged QT interval. So there are many reasons why that continuous hyperdynamic state cannot be maintained. And so then when you know that compensatory mechanism fails, that's when you see patients with systemic vasodilation and also hypotension. So what is the pulmonary response to end-stage liver disease? One, it can be just truly due to mechanical factors, the increased interabdominal pressure due to the presence of ascites or direct lung compression due to the hepatic hydrothorax, which is always on the right side. But also there are two important syndromes to be aware of. One is the hepatopulmonary syndrome or the hepat or the portal pulmonary hypertension. Two completely different syndromes but will affect the lung function. So let's first talk about the hepatopulmonary syndrome, the HPS. Starting with portal hypertension, the increase in hepatic tissue resistance. The hepatic tissue will release vasoactive mediators, endothelials, which then will cause an increase in nitric oxide production in the lungs. So therefore, we get an interpulmonary precapillary vasodilation unrelated to oxygenation levels. So blood will be getting shunted away because everything vasodilates. The way how we remember that, that's the reverse thing of the hypoxic uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's the, the reverse thing. Okay. So here, all the blood gets shunted away from the alveoli, independent from the oxygen content. So therefore, you have hypoxemia. Uh, patients present with dyspnea, clubbing as chronic hypoxic state, cyanosis. If you run a blood gas on room air, your PaO2 is less than 70 millimeter mercuries. Chest x-ray, there's looking nothing abnormal. PFDs looks completely normal. And if you do a contrast uh, TTE, um, you see that positive bubble studies as a part of, you know, we don't know where the shunting is, but most likely it's uh, intrapulmonary shunting and your chest CT will indicate those peripheral vasodilation of pulmonary blood vessels. So that's hepatic, uh, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So here's a little picture of uh, this hepatopulmonary syndrome. Again, the way I remember it, it's reverse HPV um, and uh, showing you here the massive vasodilation. So therefore, uh, limited oxygenation. Those patients present to you hypoxemia. So now let's talk about the protopulmonary hypertension. So this is now a completely different pathway, how pulmonary circulation is affected. Same trigger, portal hypertension, but here what the liver does now do as a response to the hyperdynamic circulation and the increased shear stress on the pulmonary circulation and um, the spastic volume overload increasing endothelium uh, one in thromboxane levels. Now here we see a pulmonary arterial vasoconstrictive response. And as long lasting as that is, it actually changes pulmonary vasculature anatomy in a hypertrophic form. And that hypertrophy to the point of obstructing, obliterating pulmonary arterioles, and that creates pulmonary hypertension. Those patients also will present to you with dyspnea, but they're more look volume overloaded. Uh, JVD is obvious. They have chest pain fatigue. If you run a blood gas, they're not hypoxemic. Their blood gas looks normal. At the EKG, you will see signs of uh, right ventricular pressure overload or hypertrophy. Um, the chest x-ray can show you cardiomegaly. Uh, PFT is also normal. And then in your trans uh, thoracic echo, 
you see signs of white heart walk overload, either pressure or volume, increased ventricular, uh, right ventricular systolic pressures. Uh, right heart cath should be performed if uh, the TTE looks like that, and this should then demonstrate increased in pulmonary arterial pressures. Pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. Um, and all of that should be at a normal left heart fitting or right heart fitting. Okay, so that's arterial, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So patients with portal pulmonary hypertension will present to you with the same symptoms, dyspnea, but will appear differently than patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome. Hepatopulmonary syndrome, the hypoxemia. Portal pulmonary hypertension, here the walk-up, chest x-ray, you will hopefully see an increase of the left heart border as a sign of your dilated PA. Okay. Here in the CT scan, you look at the PA, it's bigger than the order, right? Almost, you know, not double, but at least one third bigger than the order, either ascending or descending order. And you also can see on the, on the cut, uh, cut that there's cardiomegaly, dilated right heart, dilated right atrium and ventricle, and that the septum is more or less flattened. And lung biopsies or histology, here are put in slides there as well to uh, demonstrate to you that the, uh, the pulmonary arterioles are hypertrophied, so therefore, you know, there is an anatomic change in them, which may not be reversible. Hence, also, patients with portopulmonary hypertension, even after liver transplant, they don't go back to normal. And actually seeing portopulmonary hypertension can actually be a contraindication to liver transplant just because of the limitation in life expectancy related to the pulmonary hypertension. So summary here, and I'm you know, sorry for beating the dead horse, but this is something commonly misunderstood, commonly mistakes made during the ITE between hepatopulmonary syndromes and uh, portopulmonary hypertension. Two different things. Both are responses of the lung to end-stage liver disease, but hepatopulmonary syndrome is hypoxemia. Portopulmonary hypertension is pulmonary hypertension, so therefore white heart failure or dysfunction. So let's review this one more time since this is commonly misunderstood commonly mistakes made on the ITE, and there are really easy differences you just have to keep that in mind. The pulmonary response to end-stage liver disease can be either hepatopulmonary syndrome or portopulmonary hypertension. Patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome are hypoxemic. Okay, they have low PO2s on blood gas. They have normal pulmonary artery pressure. Patients with portopulmonary hypertension are not hypoxemic. They have a normal arterial blood gas, but they have increased pulmonary artery pressures. They have signs of right heart dysfunction, and these are not reversible with liver transplant. So other organs affected by end-stage liver disease, the next one in line is the kidney, just because it's very common that patients with advanced liver disease also develop renal dysfunctions. They can be related to pre-renal, as it is with GI bleed or sepsis or other factors. You know, they have uh, surely reasons for pre-renal abnormalities. Can be due to uh, intrinsic uh, um, process like uh, ATN or hepatorenal syndrome. So let's talk about hepatorenal syndrome because 10 to 15% patients with advanced severe and stage liver disease develop hepatorenal syndrome. Diagnosis-wise, they have low GFR, um, elevated incretin, so therefore a pretty significant in renal dysfunction. But in absence of any other explanation, okay, it will look to you like this is a pre-renal picture. Oliguria, urine sodium concentration less than 10 milli equivalents per liter, and sodium concentration, they're hyponatremic, um, but euphena is indicating this is a pre-renal, less than one pre-renal picture. 
Well, hepatic renal syndrome is a pre-renal picture, but actually it is happening on the level of kidney, so intrinsic in the kidney, but uh, secondary to uh, incoming uh, renal blood flow. So what happens here is that the liver cirrhosis affects in multiple ways by caudal hypertension, splenic vasodilation, and systemic vasodilation. That due to the splenic vasodilation and the systemic vasodilation, um, the splenic arterial area is underfilled and therefore shunted away from the splenic circulation. So the kidney thinks it is pre-renal, but not because of total uh, total uh, plasma status or volume status. But compensatory mechanisms will be activated as the uh, venin um, aldosterone angiotensin system. So therefore with the aldosterone will create the water and the sodium retention. However, it doesn't stay in the vascular space. So parallel, the hepatorenal syndrome goes along with ascites development and the hypotonitremia development. But due to the, all the vasocompensatory uh, um, mediators, you know, uh, the engineers, uh, norepinephrine and angiotensin, it actually worsens the renal vasoconstriction and therefore triggers even f further the uh, renal failure. So summary, liver cirrhosis triggers a splenic and a, a systemic vasodilation, um, therefore um, it shifts away, creates a pre-renal picture to the kidney in all the compensation the kidney initiates, okay, only makes the picture worse. HRS uh, can be presented in two different forms and they're primarily uh, different by time frame. HRS type one, very rapid development and really high mortality. While type two is a slower course, but here we're not talking years, we're talking months. Um, has a better prognosis, you have a little bit more time to treat, and what treatment options as temporizing you can offer is first you restore intravascular volume, albumin, you also give additional vasoactives, here more splenic, tropresoline uh, is used in Europe, here we're using metadrine, uh, vasopressin, just to reverse the shunting away from the splenic circulation, um, and uh, placing tips, also like you now has at least uh, indicated we can buy some time until we can get this patient transplanted. Because obviously all of this is reversible with liver transplantation to type one, sometimes you just don't have the time. Um, yes, you put on dialysis, but it just indicates a you know, massive deterioration of the whole system. Last, not least, let's talk about the impact of end-stage liver disease on the brain, uh, the development of hepatic encephalopathy. Symptoms can start out pretty subtle, you know, from, you know, just mild tremor or asterixis um, to more apathy, lethargia, um, slurred speech, uh, focal versus global dysfunction, impact, in, in impaired memory, uh, short or long-term memory, um, but it can go all the way down and obviously they, um, you know, significant and, and, and severe uh, impact on, on the CNS down to coma. Okay, so what happens here, the deterioration of liver function, it increases the ammonia level. And the uh, ammonia level actually is something you can measure and trend, and so therefore get an idea of um, how much the inability of detoxify uh, does affect uh, neuronal activity, and especially uh, the astrocyte function, because uh, ammonia um, and glutamate is a hyperexcitatory amino acid um, uh, that you know can affect uh, brain function very much. But also the deterioration liver function also creates an inflammatory response, which increases your cerebral blood flow. So the astrocyte function affected by the glutamine level, by mitochondrial dysfunction, increase in lactate. Uh, you're very susceptible to uh, being uh, in, in an underperfused and ischemic state. Uh, the neuronal function and extracellular state also affected by increase in the glutamine uh, levels, secondary to um, uh, ammonia increases, 
um, the neuronal calcium concentration increases, therefore there's an abnormal depolarization and it also affects the blood-brain barrier permeability. So those patients develop cerebral edema, also facilitated by your hyponatremia, also here the dis maldistribution of water content, everything is swelling, so does the brain, but it's a cytotoxic but also a vasogenic edema. In combination, uh, those patients are very uh, much at risk for decreases in cerebral perfusion pressure due to the hypertension in the vasodilation and in combination with brain swelling, also then there um, for increase in intracranial pressure in uh, developing then significant uh, levels of increased ICP and uh, creating those um, symptoms. So how does anesthesia management differ in patients with advanced liver disease? And here this is a, um, a summary I copied from a recent review paper. Um, just going through this checklist, what I do when I take care of these patients. So first, obviously, very thorough preoperative assessment to really grade the severity of the liver disease. And we look at those organ functions we are already looked in particular and see where are we at, what can be optimized, what cannot. Important, the risk stratification as a team, including the patient, including their family, including the surgeon from what is the minimal surgical risk, what's the best approach, what needs to be done, because patients need to know that they do have an increased anesthesia risk and that those perhaps compensated abnormalities can become decompensated and they can be fast deteriorating in a much worse state. So for um, you know, goals of care discussions and uh, um, what are possible complications and how this would impact their life, very much needs to be performed and uh, discussed. From the anesthesia care, um, the pharmacology changes in drug pharmacology. Uh, benzodiazepines as uh, midazolam gets metabolized differently than lorazepam, but also benzodiazepines has a high likelihood of getting paradox response, especially in patients with some form of cerebral dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy, for perform may be better agent. Dexmelatomidy may be a much better agent uh, for an anxiolytic. Um, for muscle relaxant, uh, Vecorone is 100% hepatically uh, metabolized, Drogdrome is not, versus you know, Cislatoconium, which is a completely organ-independent metabolism. Um, Saxonicoline, um, the pseudoshonesterases are produced by the liver, so here you may have a longer duration of succinicoline. Um, it's rare that it is in the hour range, but definitely from the 7 to 10 minutes, it probably may take double the time depending on where your synthetic function is. Um, volatile anesthetic do change the um, hepatic blood flow. Um, studies, newer studies have really shown that desferin and sevoflurane are acceptable um, uh, volatile anesthetics uh, with um, minimal effect of hepatic uh, blood flow as long as you maintain a unitary blood flow. You should avoid halothane, but we're not using that um, just because of uh, the metabolic requirements for halothane. And also isoflurane being metabolized also in a higher concentration. If you are planning on short-acting medications and um, uh, patients emerging after surgery, probably being better off being avoided. Uh, invasive monitoring and uvolemia, well, these are always uh, <coughs> uh, important points, but with liver cirrhosis, your um, liver uh, depends much more on the hepatic artery blood flow than a non cirrhotic liver. So, therefore, maintaining MAP, avoiding hypotension becomes much more important. Right? And volume status, obviously, with patient being hyponatremic, a low colic osmotic pressure, also, he may take some additional precautions to assess volume status and making sure that all scrunching organs are maintaining well perfused. Coagulation pattern can be very complex, so we recommend advanced coagulation monitoring with TAG. So you get an idea of what are the hypercoagulation uh, factors and the hypercoagulation factors, another imbalance of both in traditional monitoring with INR, PT, and PTT fibrinogen may not allow you that. Avoid all hepatic toxic agents. 
um, uh, and if possible, um, regional anesthesia as long as it is allowable in correlation status uh, may be a good option or a good adjunct for postoperative pain control as an opiate sparing approach. Postoperative pain, those patients will need a little bit more care and uh, obviously um, you rather uh, escalate early and then de-escalate when a patient doesn't need it anymore. So quicker care, uh, progressive care probably uh, should be utilized more aggressively. Mm -hmm. We'll spend uh, a few more slides on uh, liver transplant. Uh, this is not as commonly asked during the ITE, um, so therefore I really only will focus on the highlights. As I said, liver transplant, you're taking out a central, major, majorly important organ out and put a new one in. You disconnect it from all the major blood vessels. So that pretty much summarizes the complexity of liver transplant. But um, what we really worried about is um, that really stage when you welcome the donated organ to um, the new circulation. The time we are welcoming the new organ to um, our patient circulation is called reperfusion or the beginning of the neohepatic phase. It starts with the opening of the portal vein by allowing blood flow to return to the donated liver and then entering the systemic circulation. So what happens here is like we have a cold, acidotic, ischemic organ loaded with potassium getting reperfused and all that blood enters the systemic circulation very close to the thoracic cavity, therefore very close to the heart. So we have to be prepared for an effect of that high potassium um, uh, blood to cause EKG abnormalities from spiked T waves to broadening of QRS to sine wave to cardiac arrest. You know, that can happen. Or just due to the very cold systemic blood a drop off more than one degree Celsius um, uh, around the sinus node, we can cause bradycardia um, due to, you know, or, or any kind of block configuration. So arrhythmias are very common at that stage. In addition, the mediator loaded blood coming back from a ischemic 1.5 kilo organ, um, that in a patient who's already vasodilated secondary to end stage uh, liver disease, you can see hypotension, a reduction in contactility, you know, further drop in your SVR. And depending on, uh, you're getting venous blood back, obviously kind of like depending on the preparation of this donated organ, there also can be embolization going on. Sometimes we see fine bubbles, micro bubbles, but uh, sometimes we see larger particles and creating a PE. Uh, in that time also, we may see transient increases in your pulmonary vascular resistance and creating uh, pulmonary hypertension, um, the microembolization, or just the return of a lot of systemic blood flow also can create a temporary um, hypervolemic situation. The fun doesn't just stop there after you are stabilizing the hemodynamic response to reperfusion and uh, correcting the electrolyte abnormalities. Um, obviously, in addition to uh, uh, the potassium, there also are calcium abnormalities um, due to blood product citrate metabolism. Um, when you don't have a liver, you don't metabolize citrate, and that metabolism uh, kicks up slowly. You're also now in the uh, prolonged neopathic phase. Um, after reperfusion and after hemodynamic stabilization, pay a very close attention to your correlation system. Okay. Um, due to the inflammatory response, the mediators, um, we are triggering some form of DIC kind of picture. You know, the, um, all the mediators, the fragments, you know, activating your intravascular correlation system. So we commonly on the tag see fibrinolysis. Um, as uh, shown here too, like this little fishtail sign shown to you here on the tag. Um, so um, it's common that we need to give uh, fibrinogen products, either as cryo or as FFP, in platelets to address uh, the 
uh, platelet dysfunction, the low platelet level, and the now also and on top of it, the consumption of fibrogen uh, during that time. But it should be transient because as soon as the liver is reperfused, enjoys the uh, substrate and oxygen it receives, that new functional liver should actually pick up the slack pretty nicely and then therefore um, produce correlation factors early on. So you thrive for normothermia and then also to maintain hemodynamic stability in the time period. So I think uh, we covered a lot of knowledge today in this presentation, but this should really cover all the um, hepatology related keywords um, on the ITE uh, content. Good luck with the test. Thank you very much for your attention.